Hello, everyone. My name is Tiffany Dangleman. We are pleased that you could all join us for this week's lecture in volume three of our No Neuroanatomy Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of the No Neuropsychology Board, as well as members of the No Neuropsychology Committee. We would like to thank our 2023 sponsors for their generous financial support in this series. Additionally, we are grateful to our Society of Clinical Neuropsychology colleagues for their sponsorship and wanted to share information about their upcoming convention programming at APA in Washington, DC. This will include seven invited speakers, nine symposia, three scientific poster sessions, a SCN presidential address, and member town hall meeting. Registration for APA 2023 is now open. Before we start our lecture, one of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free, high quality didactic content to our audience. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available on our YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures to get first access to new content. New to No Neuropsychology is our collaboration with APPCN to bring you learning and discussion questions that are provided with specific lectures content. You can access these on our website and through APPCN. Here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cal Jeanette for today's lecture titled Memory, the Papet Circuit and Beyond. Dr. Cal Jeanette is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor of clinical psychiatry and neurology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He earned his master's degree in gerontology from the University of South Florida and PhD in clinical psychology with emphasis in neuropsychology from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He completed his pre-doctoral clinical psychology internship with emphasis in adult neuropsychology at the University of Chicago Medical Center and fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Illinois Chicago Medical Center. Dr. Jeanette's clinical interests include neuropsychological assessment of adults with complex medical, psychiatric, and psychosocial presentations. He also has specialty clinics for older adults with primary memory concerns and candidates for solid organ transplantation. His current research focuses on the relationship between health behaviors, such as aerobic exercise, sedentary behavior, and medical treatment adherence, and neuropsychological functioning in chronically ill patients. He also has active research in the neurocognitive and psychiatric factors of long COVID. Dr. Jeanette, turning it over to you. All right, so uh, thank you again for that fantastic introduction, Tiffany, and thank you all for spending hopefully less than an hour with me today to learn about the PAPE circuit and the underlying neuroanatomy of memory. Um, I'm gonna caveat this by saying this in itself could be in a semester long course and there's no way I would be able to get through all of the intricate details and the molecular and cellular bits of memory. So I'm gonna keep it very big picture and clinically relevant and what kind of things that you would need to know from the standpoint of differential diagnosis and more at that macro level for neuropsychology. All right, so to start off, let's go through an outline of what I'm gonna try and cover. So first we're gonna go over just the basics of memory, the hierarchy of memory and how memory is subdivided. Then we're gonna get into the neuroanatomy of those different domains of memory. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about the medial temporal lobes and the medial diencephalon 
and how those come together to be the PAPE circuit. And of course, a brief little bit about the quote unquote beyond that I included in my title. And finally, I'm gonna give you some quick little exemplars of different disorders and types of uh, disorders and cases that present with different kinds of neuroanatomical dysfunction that results in memory dysfunction. Okay, so let's get into it. So first we're gonna talk about the basics of memory. And for many of this, I hope this is just a throwback to our experiences in undergrad when we were learning all these basics. But essentially human memory is broken down into three primary domains. We have long-term memory, which is then subdivided in declarative and non-declarative memory. And then we have quote unquote, short-term sensory working memory. There's all sorts of different synonyms that aren't completely consistent, but ubiquitously are anything that are not long-term memory. Let's go through these bit by bit. So first off, your short-term memory domains can be broken generally into sensory memory, short-term memory, and working memory. Now, although they are called memory, they are not technically from the standpoint of clinical neuroscience memory, but what we can consider them is basically short-term holdings of information that we experience in the environment. So starting with sensory memory, this is shortly held information in our sensory attention. These are kind of echoes of information that we get from the environment. It has a high capacity, but it's very short-lived. This could be things like hearing the grocery list that somebody asked you to go uh, get or seeing images for a few seconds before you have to turn around and go do something else. They're very quick, high capacity, but short-lived bits of information from the environment. The next step up is short-term memory, which is longer held, but still a short amount of, in, of time, seconds to minutes, and it has a more limited capacity compared to sensory memory. These are the things that we can hold in our mind briefly that we need to hold on to to go write down or something that we need to hold on to while we're engaging in conversation with somebody or listening to the instructions that someone might be giving us on a test. And finally, the next step up is working memory. Working memory is even more limited capacity and it's the storage of short-term information in our sort of mind's eye with the idea here that we're going to perform some sort of man mental manipulation or operation on that information. So for example, if I were to give you guys my office phone number, you would hold that in your mind by either chewing on it, reiterating it, manipulating it in some way, long enough for you to spit it out later on. Or if I asked you to do some mental arithmetic right now, you'd have to hold that information in your head, manipulate it to generate a response that you would spit back out to me. The working memory is a very active process that engages a lot of other systems beyond just our attention. And that leads us into the chunk that we're really gonna focus on today, which is long-term memory. This is generally what a clinical neuroscientist thinks about when we say the word memory. Things that get turned into long-term permanent bits of information that we can retrieve and recall later on. Long-term memory is broken into two main components, but both components are information that are retained for a significant amount of time. We're talking on the hours of, or on the office of hours, days, months, or even years. It's divided into two subdomains of declarative and non-declarative memory. Declarative memory is the memory that we have for events and facts for which we have a conscious access to. Emphasis here on conscious. It's something that we have to have had firsthand experience or awareness of that we are retrieving from, from some sort of memory storage. And that we can typically make some sort of verbal report of. We can talk about it using language. Now, declarative memory is broken into two further components that we call episodic and semantic memory. Episodic memory is our autobiographical event memory for things that we've experienced firsthand. So this could be for important dates in our life, firsthand experiences like um, holidays, like in this picture right after Christmas when I got my awesome little toy car. Or it could be things that we have a firsthand experience with secondhand. So for example, having observed something that we weren't necessarily involved in directly, but that we have some sort of mental image for from an experience. And this is in contrast to semantic memory, which is more memory for facts and information. These are things that you've learned from some sort of autobiographical experience, but you can't necessarily pin it down to a specific event. So for example, it's a fact to know that Barack Obama was the 44th president of the United States. 
but we may not know the exact autobiographical moment in which we learned that information. Similarly, our knowledge for different kinds of mental skills and abilities like math or language are considered semantic memories as well. So for example, when you're all looking at this little arithmetic for two plus two equals five, you're immediately saying to yourself, okay, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Two plus two is four. Well, that access to that semantic information is part of your semantic memory network. And it's stored in the same way as explicit episodic memory, but it's considered a different domain from episodic memory. So how is declarative memory formed? When we talk about the formation of new memories, we have to go through a couple of different phases. So before we can ever learn or remember a new thing, we have to be able to pay attention and acquire that information. We literally have to take the information, collect it from the environment, maybe somebody talking to you or something you're observing in the environment. And then we have to load it up into our frontal lobe, into our working memory, and then ship it off to other parts of the brain to be converted into a memory. So that information is collected through the frontal lobe. It's sent to the memory factory in the brain, which we'll be talking about later, to be turned into a permanent long-term memory. Once that process is complete, that information gets stored somewhere in the brain. We don't really know how or where, that's a Nobel Prize waiting to happen, but we know we have storehouses in the cortex that keep hold of information that we can later search for and retrieve. So we have to create memories by paying attention, sending them to the factory, and then going and picking up later from the storehouses that we put that new long-term information in. Now this is discrete from non-declarative memory or implicit memory. Non-declarative memory is memory for information in which there is minimal to no conscious awareness and employs algorithms that operate an automatic unconscious level. The most common examples of non-declarative memory that we typically think of are procedural memory and classical conditioning. So procedural memory are those abilities that we learn over time, but again, we do not have an episodic memory trace for. The fact of how we all hopefully know how to ride a bike or how we know how to draw or paint or write, those are procedural memories that don't have episodic memory traces and are encoded and consolidated differently in the brain from explicit memory or declarative memory. Similarly, things like classical conditioning are things that are associative learning. This doesn't require the same systems as the episodic or semantic memory system. Other forms of non-declarative memory, which are not as often talked about or measured, especially in neuropsychology, are things like perceptual priming and non-associative learning like reflexes and habituation and sensitization. Perceptual priming is how we change our response to a stimulus following a prior exposure to that same stimulus. So for example, here I've got these two uh, little to-do lists of things I need to get at the store. On that first one, I'm priming you to figure out what that last word might be. So the list is carrots, bread, salad. So you're being primed to assume that this is gonna be some sort of food, maybe soup. Now in the other list, I'm priming you for a different outcome, even though the words are, or rather the first letter and last letter are the same. So towel, toothbrush, shampoo. I wouldn't say soup in this instance, I would say soap. So we use the stimulus and prior exposure and prior knowledge to figure out or be primed for what comes next. And then finally, non-associative learning, which doesn't take any brain neocortical abilities at all, are reflexes, our habituation, our sensitization. These are automatic, non-conscious responses to stimuli that are often noxious. These are things that are so evolutionarily ingrained in us that it doesn't even take our higher cortical abilities to do. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay, let's get into the neuroanatomy now. So we're not going to exhaustively go into all the steps of neuroanatomy because again, that could be an entire semester long course, but we're going to focus specifically on the declarative memory circuitry and briefly on the non-declarative circuitry. Okay, so let's start with the declarative or explicit memory circuit. So this was episodic memory, remember our autobiographical experiences and firsthand knowledge, and semantic memory for facts and information. 
These abilities are subserved by two critical systems called the medial temporal lobe and the medial diencephalon. Let's break that down a little bit more. So these two systems, the medial temporal lobe and the medial diencephalon, are critical to the formation of new long-term memory, specifically declarative long-term memory. The medial temporal lobes are comprised of the hippocampal formation and the parahippocampal gyrus, whereas the medial diencephalon is comprised of the fornix, the mammillary bodies, and the anterior thalamic nuclei. These two systems are interconnected with each other and complement each other, and they're also connected throughout the cortex and together consolidate and retrieve declarative memories. So it's important to note here that while these two systems are critical to the formation of new long-term memory, it's also the white matter connectivity between these regions that are essential to the formation of new memory as well. So let's start with the medial temporal lobe. So of course, we all know where the temporal lobes are. They are inferior to the frontal and parietal cortices and they are anterior to the occipital cortex. We have temporal lobes on each side, and each temporal lobe, generally speaking, is specialized for certain types of information. For most people, the left temporal lobe is specialized for verbal information, whereas the right temporal lobe is specialized for nonverbal visual information. Now, the medial temporal lobe memory system is comprised of the hippocampal formation and the parahippocampal gyrus. Within the hippocampal formation, we have the dentate gyrus, the hippocampus proper, and the subiculum. And in the parahippocampal gyrus, we have the entorhinal cortex. So when we talk about the hippocampal formation in particular, we are talking about the hippocampus and all of the immediate deep gray subcortical structures that are not part of the cortex that are attached directly to the hippocampus proper. Whereas the parahippocampal, Parahippocampal gyrus are the cortices that are immediately around the hippocampus and support input and output into the hippocampal formation. So in these diagrams here, we can see the hippocampus is made in purple. So in the top figure, we have a sagittal cut and we're able to appreciate the fact that the hippocampus looks like a little corn dog inside the temporal lobe. That's how I always remember where it is. Whereas on a coronal slice on the bottom here, we could see the uh, S pattern or the interlocking links of the various parts of the hippocampal formation that are often referred to as the cinnamon roll or the jelly donut. Okay, from another view, here's a coronal um, MRI slice. So here we can see in the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampi on either side. And similarly here, if we look at sagittal cuts where we remove the lateral temporal lobe, and look inside, we can see the long hot dog shape of the hippocampus and the interconnected diencephalon, which we'll be talking about more in a second. Okay, so the hippocampal formation is comprised of these three different domains. And on coronal section, the hippocampus has that curving S-shape appearance, which is where it gets its name. Hippocampus is the scientific name for the seahorse. Now, information in the hippocampal uh, formation flows through the medial temporal lobe system in a very systemic way. We're not really going to get into the details of the molecular biology or the cellular level stuff here, but suffice to say that information comes in through the parahippocampal gyrus, flows through the various um, segments of the hippocampus before leaving out through the parahippocampal gyrus to connect to the diencephalon and other association cortices. In a more basic schematic, it generally looks like this. So again, this is a coronal slice. Information is generally speaking, entering through the parahippocampal gyrus, being processed through the CA field, and then being um, exported or output through the subiculum to go into the association cortices and the diencephalon. So the hippocampus proper, the bit here in the dark orange and light orange, is comprised of four pyramidal cell sectors called the cornoi amomus area, which are named for Amon, who was a Greek god, uh, a Greek god who had the ram horn, which is how this structure gets its name. Okay, so let's start getting into each section in detail. The hippocampus proper, which we're all pretty familiar with at this point, is the anterior portion of the hippocampal formation. 
The head of the hippocampus is referred to as the Pez hippocampus. And it's the most anterior aspect of the hippocampal formation. And the hippocampus essentially is the memory factory of the brain. The hippocampus is the structure that is critical for consolidation, the ability to take short-term information and transform it into permanent long-term information that is stored elsewhere in the brain. It's very important to remember that the hippocampus is not the site where information is stored for long-term storage. That is, that's been proven elsewhere through the studies of HM, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we know for sure that when the hippocampus is offline, memory that's already been made is still well-preserved. So information is not permanently stored in the hippocampi. Okay, now moving naturally through the rest of the hippocampal formation is the dentate gyrus. This is named for its tooth-like appearance on the medial surface. And the dentate gyrus has been shown recently to be one of the few parts of the brain that actually shows neurogenesis in adulthood, which might be a target for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. The dentate gyrus is essential for the, to, uh, the encoding and input of new information into the hippocampal formation. The subiculum, which gets its name for its supportive role in bringing information out of the hippocampus and into the rest of the cortex, um, is the primary off-ramp out of the hippocampal formation. And then the parahippocampal gyrus are the cortex that are immediately medial to the hippocampal formation, seen here on the ventral view of the brain. And the hippocampus would be inside the temporal lobes on either side, where the temporal lobes would be the corn of the corn dog. The parahippocampal gyrus is the most medial aspect of that cortex hugging the edges of the hippocampi proper. Now, the parahippocampal gyrus is critically important to the input and output of information into the hippocampal factory system. There are several cortical connections to the parahippocampal gyrus from throughout the cortex to send information into hippocampal formation via the entorhinal cortex. The entorhinal cortex, which is a component of the parahippocampal gyrus, is in the anterior portions of the parahippocampal gyrus, and it's immediately adjacent to the subiculum and the head of the hippocampus. And as I said, the entorhinal cortex is the major input and output relay between the hippocampal formation and the association cortices throughout the brain. Okay, now getting into the second system, the medial diencephalon. So everything we've talked about so far has lived in the temporal lobes, deep in the medial and mesial aspects of the temporal lobe. Now we're talking about very ancient and deep gray matter structures that live mostly at the midline of the brain. The three primary components of the medial diencephalon are the fornix, the mammillary bodies, and the anterior salamic nuclei. The fornix gets its name for its arch shape, it begins at the, the uh, superior aspect of the hippocampus and carries anteriorly down toward the front of the brain and terminates into the mammillary body. We're going to talk about that pathway here in a second. Let's talk about the different components of the fornix first so you're aware of the anatomy. So importantly, the fornix is the primary white matter pathway from the medial temporal lobe system into the diencephalon. This is where all the information that's entered into the hippocampal formation is exported into the diencephalon to go through the consolidation process. The fornix is broken generally into four components. The first component is called the fimbra, and fimbra is Latin for roughly fringe or edge because of its kind of edge-like appearance on the surface of the hippocampus. It's the first synaptic contact from the hippocampal formation into the diencephalon. This is the true transition zone from the medial temporal lobes into the diencephalon. The next stage of the hippocampal, or excuse me, the diencephalic system are the crooks or the crusts of the uh, fornix, which refers to, or gets the name legs because there's one on each side and they look like legs of the fornix. And this brings the information toward the midline of the brain and allows communication between the two hippocampi in either uh, temporal lobe via a structure called the hippocampal commissure. So if we look at this from a superior view, we can see the two uh, fornii coming in toward the midline. And when they reach the midline here, there's a webbing that connects the two, which we refer to as the commissure of the fornix or the hippocampal commissure. 
And this is what allows our two hippocampi to exchange information and work together to connect visual and verbal memories. Carrying along the pathway of the fornix, we have the body of the fornix, which is just the most superior aspect immediately above the third ventricle and below the corpus callosum. The body of the fornix then plunges inferiorly down toward the mammillary bodies, in what we call the anterior column or the columns of the fornix. And the anterior columns of the fornix bring information down into the mammillary body. The mammillary bodies are the most inferior aspect of the diencephalic system, and they are a critical relay node between the fornix and the thalamus. So information passes through the white matter track of the fornix, reaches this gray matter structure called the mammillary body, and passes that information up into the thalamus. Now, importantly, the mammillary bodies have a lot of clinical significance to us as neuropsychologists. The mammillary bodies are highly sensitive to thiamine deficiency and have been implicated in retrograde amnestic syndrome that we're going to talk about a little bit. Okay, so once the information has left the anterior thalamic nuclei, uh, or rather enters the anterior thalamic nuclei via the mammalothalamic tract. So it leaves the mammillary bodies and enters the mammalothalamic tract and then goes up into the anterior aspect of the thalamus. And from another view, we look at the thalamus and all of its complicated components. The anterior nuclei is at the most anterior aspect of the thalamus. This is the anterior, posterior of the thalamus, and enters via the mammalothalamic tract. And information leaves the anterior thalamus via the cingulate, or to the cingulate via the internal capsule, which is a thick white matter bundle that passes down through our basal ganglia and also carries somatosensory and motor information from the cortex. Now, once that information leaves the anterior thalamic nuclei up through the internal capsule, it enters the cingulate gyrus, the oldest cortical part of the brain. So this is truly the boundary zone between the neocortex and the limbic system. And the cingulate gyrus carries all that information that's been passed through the system so far back uh, posteriorly to re-enter the system into the temporal lobe at the hippocampus via the entorhinal cortex. Okay, let's take a breath. That's a whole lot of dense neuroanatomy. That's a whole lot of complicated directions and nuclei and things like that. So let's break it down one more time from a different view and take it one bit at a time. Now, when we combine the medial temporal lobe system and the diencephalon, you've got yourself the PAPE circuit. The PAPE circuit is the most essential circuit for the formation of declarative new memory. Without an intact PAPE circuit, you have amnesia. Any disruption along this process, anywhere along the white matter tracks or the gray matter structures in the system, damage to those parts will result in interrograde amnesia the inability to form new memories. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But let's go one more time through the anatomy. If we start down in the hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe, information leaves, or at rather enters the medial temporal lobe system from the rest of the cortex via the entorhinal cortex, which is in the parahippocampal gyrus. So the corn of the corn dog has the parahippocampal gyrus and the entorhinal cortex. Those structures, send information into the hippocampus proper and the hippocampal formation, which consolidates the information into long-term memory, begins the process of consolidation. From the hippocampus, we leave the hippocampal formation via the fornix to enter the diencephalon. So the fornix is a big, thick white matter tract that leaves the hippocampus and goes superior and anteriorly into the midline of the brain to transfer information from the medial uh, temporal lobes into the medial diencephalon. As the fornix wraps around and goes inferiorly, it terminates in the mammillary bodies. The mammillary bodies then project via the mammalothalamic tract to the anterior thalamic nucleus. And from the anterior thalamic nucleus via the internal capsule, we send information up into the cingulate or the cingulum the oldest cortical part of the brain, 
to be sent posteriorly back through to the back of the hippocampus proper and to re-enter the system via the entorhinal cortex and complete the circuit. When information makes it all the way through the system, you've now created yourself a new declarative memory. Okay, so here's a stick and ball model of the PAPE circuit. Again, just another way to look at this so that you can process information and, pro and learn the depth. So we won't go through it again, but essentially the information loops through posteriorly, anteriorly, and then back through posteriorly to re-enter the medial temporal lobes. Here's another view just to make it easier because visual memory is the best. And again, a stick and ball model, remembering here that the anterior portion of the brain is to our left. Okay, so let's bring this all together now and go back to our first model here where we talked about how we acquire, consolidate, and search for and retrieve new information. So when we talk about the acquisition and organization of new information, we're talking about our frontal lobes, our ability to sustain our attention, pay attention to what somebody is saying, and take that information in through the front door of our brain. That information is then sent down the highways of the brain, the subcortical system, the white matter tracks, to the medial temporal lobe and the medial diencephalon, where that information is put through the memory factory of the medial temporal and diencephalic system, the PAPE circuit, to be turned into a permanent memory. Now remember, the PAPE circuit is not where we store information. So once that information is done being formed, it gets sent back out into the cortex to be stored. That's when our frontal subcortical systems take over again. And when we have to go find that information, we use our frontal cortex to go search for that information, retrieve it, bring it back through the white matter tracks to the frontal lobe to then spit that information out. So consolidation is completely subserved by the PAPE circuit whereas acquisition and retrieval are frontal subcortical system functions. Okay, so I promised I would very briefly go over non-declarative memory. It's not gonna be anywhere near as exhaustive because as neuropsychologists, we're often not evaluating this in any kind of formal way. So remember we talked about procedural memories, your memory for sort of motor memories, the things we know how to do like riding a bike or painting, drawing, writing, things like that. These are abilities that are entirely subserved by the basal ganglia, the deep gray matter structures in the motor system. When our basal ganglia is functioning properly, we retain these abilities. Even when the PAPE circuit is damaged, as we're gonna see in an example here shortly, we retain the ability to hold on to procedural memories and learn new procedural memories. Classical conditioning, on the other hand, doesn't require any of these deep gray matter structures. It's entirely a function of the amygdala and the cerebellum. It's pure associative learning. No PAPE circuit involved, no basal ganglia involved. In terms of perceptual priming, this is a cortical ability. So these are higher cortical functions that are pure uh, classic associative learning beyond classical conditioning, where we use priming to feed into what our next uh, act will be. It makes the system more efficient. Whereas reflexes and other non-associative learning abilities don't even enter the brain. These are abilities that are entirely at the level of our spine and our peripheral nerves. So for example, if you were to touch a hot pan on your stove, your immediate response to jerk your hand back is something that's automatic, non-conscious, and entirely reflexive at the level of your spinal root ganglion. Now, eventually that information milliseconds later gets sent up to your brain to process what just happened, but that immediate response of pulling your hand away is entirely reflexive. And it's really not fair to call it memory, but it's considered a non-declarative memory. Okay, so now let's transition to talking about what happens when these structures get uh, dysfunctional, when they get damaged, or when they're not working properly, and what kind of memory disorders are uh, commonly associated with damage to these systems. So first, let's talk about what memory dysfunction is. I've said a couple of these terms a few times now. Amnesia is the inability to form a new memory. So this most often is in reference to episodic memory. 
When we say someone has amnesia, we're usually referring to declarative memory loss and particularly referring to episodic memory. Anterograde amnesia is the inability to form new memory. It's the inability to take in new information, put it through the factory, and make it into a permanent memory. When someone has an anterograde amnesia, we refer to that as rapid forgetting. Essentially, once the information leaves the sensory, short-term, or working memory systems of the frontal lobe, it's completely gone because it's not getting consolidated because those structures that underlie the ability to make a new memory are no longer functional. Essentially, anterograde amnesia is a failure to consolidate information. Retrograde amnesia is the impaired ability to recall pre-existing memories. So these are things that have made it through the whole tape circuit consolidation memory circuitry, but have now been lost due to damage in other parts of the diencephalon or other kinds of cortical injury. Typically, retrograde amnesia is temporally graded, meaning that things that are most recent in time to the time of the damage to the system that caused the retrograde amnesia are usually the most dysfunctional, whereas things further back in a temporally graded fashion are typically well-maintained and recallable. Now, in more severe cases, some people might not be, be able to remember some or all of their life or even their identity prior to the onset of the injury. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but there are many, 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 many different things that can cause memory dysfunction. Some of these we're gonna be very familiar with, Alzheimer's disease being the most classic. We also know of things like cerebrovascular diseases that might not cause some of these uh, systems due to strokes or other kinds of white matter lesions. Talk about things like carbon monoxide and anoxic injuries, and then things like tumors that might be growing in the brain and pressing on these different areas and disrupting their flow. Other things that can cause memory dysfunction in more acute ways are reversible infections and metabolic encephalopathies. Think like delirium, think older adults who have UTIs and are delirious and can't encode new information. This is a reversible memory disorder. This isn't due to direct damage to the system. But other things can also cause irreversible damage or short-term damage to these systems, such as seizures, electroconvulsive therapy, head injuries, and psychogenic events. A little bit of time we have left here. Here's some exemplars of memory disorders. No memory disorder function uh, talk would ever be complete without mentioning good old HM, Henry Malayason, uh, who passed away in 2008. Henry, of course, had medial temporal, his medial temporal lobe surgically resected as a treatment for intractable epilepsy when he was 27 years old. That surgery resulted in about two thirds of his hippocampal formation being resected, as well as his parahippocampal gyrus his entire entorhinal cortices, and aspects of his amygdala. What that generally looked like is the mesial and medial temporal parts of his brain were resected. And here's imaging of his brain showing those areas that they surgically removed to treat his epilepsy. Now, as we all know, after his surgery, Henry had pretty decent remittance of his seizures but he also came out with a severe, dense, anterograde amnesia. He was no longer able to form new memories following his surgery in 1953. And he also had a temporally graded retrograde amnesia for information that was not fully consolidated through his memory system, roughly for about five to seven years prior to his surgery. Now, interestingly, as we know, the medial temporal lobes are critical for the formation of new explicit memory. But let's dissociate that from procedural memory, which does not require the PAPE circuit. Now, while Henry was very much that 51st date cliche, where you'd introduce yourself to him, and as soon as his working memory uh, got distracted or he looked away, he turned around and he'd recognize you, or he wouldn't recognize you as somebody he's met, and you'd be a brand new person again. In contrast, he was still able to lay down new procedural memory. For example, he had his surgery in 1953, which means that everything after 1953 would indicate he cannot make a new memory. However, in 1966, he was able to draw this floor plan of the house he lived in five years after his surgery in 1958. And he lived in this house for about 
10, 20 years. He was able to recall this house and its floor pan over three years after, roughly in the late 1970s, he moved to a new home. So this procedural, non-explicit, non-verbal mediated memory was able to be encoded and consolidated because it does not require the medial temporal or diencephalic memory system. So what Henry had was a severe deficit in his memory consolidation. He had anterograde amnesia, and he had a temporally graded retrograde amnesia for most events immediately before his surgery, and some events up to 11 years prior to his surgery. However, his procedural memory was fully intact. He was able to form and retain new motor skills, as exemplified by the mirror star drawing test. So for those that might not be familiar, the mirror star drawing test is essentially where the person is given this outline of a star, and the star is covered up from their field of view by this little plate in front of them, and they can see the inverse reflection of the star in the mirror down here. So they have to try and draw and trace through the borders of the star like a maze, as accurately as they can. Because their brain, or because the image is flipped, this is something that takes motor learning and it has a novel component to it. Henry was able to get better at this over time. This was essentially him learning to ride a bike for the first time. He was bad at it at first, but he got more and more coordinated and was able to do it and get better at it and maintain that better performance. And that's because his basal ganglia were still functional and the basal ganglia mediate procedural memory. So if we go back to our schematic here, Henry's dysfunction was entirely in the declarative memory circuitry of the long-term memory system, whereas his sensory short-term and working memory and non-declarative memory systems were fully intact. So if we think about where the breakdown is in the system, Henry had functional frontal lobes and functional subcortical systems. So he didn't have any problems with taking new information in and searching and retrieving information that had already been formed. But he was unable to form new memories because the memory factory of his brain had been surgically resected. Therefore, he was no longer able to consolidate this information that he was taking in into being a permanent long-term memory. Therefore, when he goes back to try and retrieve that information, there's nothing to retrieve because the factory never made it in the first place. Okay, let's do a little more contrasting here of medial temporal from medial diencephalic lesions and this, uh, the syndromes that present. So with medial temporal uh, lobe lesions, you're always going to end up with an anterograde amnesia and less commonly with retrograde amnesia. Common causes of medial temporal lobe dysfunction are anoxia, so the brain not getting enough oxygen, the hippocampi are incredibly oxygen greedy, parts of the brain, so they're preferentially affected by the absence of oxygen. Herpes simplex virus preferentially attacks the mesial temporal lobe. And of course, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by pathology in the hippocampi. Now in contrast, medial diencephalic lesions have anterograde amnesia, just like medial temporal, but they often are accompanied by a pretty significant retrograde memory dysfunction as well. As with Henry, these retrograde memory dysfunctions are typically temporally graded with greater impairment for more recent time periods closer to the incident that damaged the system. And they typically have frontal lesions that are also involved in how efficiently information is processed. Now, a classic example of a diencephalic lesion would be Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So let's talk about the classic neuropsych profile of Alzheimer's disease, the most well-known mesial temporal lobe dysfunction. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease that's characterized by a predictable course of cognitive decline. The first core symptom is anterograde amnesia. The disease, for most cases, starts in the hippocampi and is characterized by rapid forgetting that gets worse as the disease progresses, whereas retrograde memory is typically preserved earlier on in the disease. As the disease progresses into the temporal lobe, language and semantic systems start to be knocked offline, so semantic memory starts to take a hit. As the disease progresses further, it starts to move into the frontal and parietal cortices, and you start to see deficits in executive functioning, working memory, and attention. And finally, often behavior and personality changes come after that. So we look at that anatomically. 
So the disease starts in the hippocampi, migrates out into the lateral temporal lobes, and then up into the frontal and parietal cortices, which results in a predictable pattern of decline, where long-term episodic memory formation, followed by semantic memory deficits and expressive and receptive language dysfunction, and executive functioning and mood and affect regulation problems. So just like Henry, while we didn't, we're not surgically removing somebody, uh, somebody's hippocampi who have Alzheimer's disease, the disease is essentially doing that for us. The disease starts to destroy the hippocampal system. It disrupts the PAPE circuit. Once you've disrupted that circuitry, you are no longer able to consolidate things into new long-term storage, and therefore you have an anterograde amnesia. And same thing from another angle here. We've cut off the PAPE circuit. The system is no longer fully connected. Therefore, we have amnesia. Now, let's look at a diencephalic lesion. So Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, we're all pretty familiar with this, is caused by a thiamine deficiency. It's most commonly seen in people with chronic alcohol use disorders. When people have alcohol use disorders, they're often replacing the healthy calories of a, of a normal diet with the empty calories of alcohol. So they end up malnourished with significant thiamine deficiencies. You don't have to have an alcohol use disorder end up with Wernicke's Korsakoff. You can also have severe malnourishment or nutrient deficiencies. These thiamine deficiencies called bi cause bilateral necrosis of the mammillary body and other periventricular nuclei. And cognitively, this results in anterograde amnesia and a pretty dense retrograde amnesia. Another common feature that differentiates somebody with a Wernicke's Korsakoff amnesia from a medial temporal amnesia is they often lack insight and awareness into the amnesia early on. And they have a tendency to confabulate their memories rather than saying, I don't know or I don't recall. They'll often fill in gaps that are missing in their memory traces because they're not aware of the fact that they have memory dysfunction. So with Wernicke's Korsakoff, we're talking about disruption to the diencephalic aspect of the PAPE circuit. We've knocked off the mammillary body. So the fornix is no longer delivering information to these um, structures, and the information is not being carried on to the anterior thalamic nuclei to complete the loop back to the hippocampi. OK, so let's review and wrap it all up uh, the basics of the neuroanatomy of memory. So memory is a process that's divisible into two main forms, declarative, explicit conscious memories that are subdivided into semantic and episodic memories, and non-declarative, implicit, non-conscious memories, which we generally think of as procedural memory. These forms of memory are subserved by distinct neuroanatomical systems. The declarative memory system is served by the medial temporal lobe and the diencephalon that together form the PAPE circuit. The non-declarative memory system is subserved by other structures outside of the PAPE circuit, including the basal ganglia, cerebellum, amygdala, cortex, and reflex pathway. A disruption of the PAPE circuit will always result in an anterograde amnesia. And depending where in the PAPE circuit, particularly typically the anterior diencephalon, you will develop retrograde amnesias as well. Okay, with that, I think I hit my time. And I would love to take any questions that anyone may have. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette, for such an informative lecture on memory. Um, we have a couple questions here. The first question is, which adult tests are used on the inpatient unit versus outpatient for assessing memory concerns as a patient recovers from injury or over the course of the development of dementia? Uh, great question. So generally speaking, when we contrast outpatient evaluations from inpatient, we're really trying to think about what are the limitations of the tools that we have that were explicitly developed to be given a nice, quiet, distraction-free environment like our offices. Um, when we go on inpatient, we're often being asked to consult people who have had acute injuries or who have presented for other problems and we're worried about their discharge and safety to go home. So you can use the exact same tools that you use in your outpatient clinic, but you just have to understand what the limitations of that are going to be and how the environment may impact the person's ability to perform those perform on those tests. 
So if we're talking about trying to differentiate whether somebody has a medial temporal or diencephalic problem, you can use our standard tests like less learning tests, story memory tests, visual memory tests. If they are unable to consolidate that information, you're looking at somebody that has a paid circuit dysfunction. You can corroborate that with your neurobehavioral exam and the information you're getting from your behavioral observations to further understand what parts of the system might be disrupted. If the individual is confabulating on your test, so filling in with nonsense details like on the story memory or something like that, or they're having a hard time recounting their history to you, and they're maybe telling you accurate information from their distant past that doesn't really apply to their recent past, you may be thinking about something more confabulatory and is looking at a diencephalic lesion. Um, now for people that have non pape circuit dysfunction, you're talking about people with basal ganglia problems. You're thinking about maybe uh, Huntington's disease or Parkinson's disease. And we don't really have common tools, at least not in my repertoire, uh, to measure procedural memories in the same way we do declarative memories. So the long and short of that is you do the same thing that you do on outpatient, but you just have to be much more aware of what the limitations of your tools are and the sensitivity of your norms for the environment that you're evaluating the person in. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have uh, is which structures are involved in learning a list of words versus learning a story? Oh, excellent question. So. If you're differentiating that, you're talking about two different verbal memory tasks. So let's say it's the Ray Vault and logical memory from the WIM, right? So both of those are following the same pathway. We're paying attention. We're acquiring the information with our frontal lobe system. We're putting that information up on the truck and sending it to the memory factory to be consolidated and then sending it off to be stored somewhere else in the brain to be later retrieved by the frontal lobe. So the underlying neuroanatomy is the same, but the efficiency in which somebody can encode and acquire new information is going to be different. So with a story memory test, you're giving them scaffolding. You're helping them organize the information into a meaningful way that helps them take in more of the information more efficiently. So that by the time you send it to the hippocampus, more information is getting there. In contrast to most list learning tasks, which are unstructured, they're tasks that don't have any kind of clear relationship between the words, you know, not counting the CVLT or the HVLT. So the person has to create their own scaffolding and their own context to learn the information. So if somebody has a frontal lobe injury and they have some executive and working memory dysfunction, list learning tests are going to be more difficult for them compared to conte contextual story memory tests. And that's one great way to understand the bases for somebody's memory complaints. They may be able to learn and remember structured information because you're scaffolding it for them, but they have a terrible time trying to learn and remember unstructured information because they don't have the frontal lobe function to be able to organize that information in a meaningful way. Thank you. And then one more question before we go. How are memories that are not based on quote unquote real sensory or autobiographical events can be explained by dysfunction of the Pepe's circuit or other systems? Hmm. Um, not sure I understand the question. Could you see that? So actually I'm looking at it in the chat here. Um, I'm wondering about how memories that are totally confabulated, not based on real. Oh, I see. So in the terms of confabulation, and that's a, a very helpful um, uh, clarification point I need to make, confabulation is typically the recall of accurate information, but it's in the wrong point in time in the person's life course. So for example, if you have somebody in the hospital you're evaluating for Wernicke's Corsakov, they're you know, malnourished and they just had their thiamine repleted, but they're continuing to experience significant memory dysfunction. If you ask that person, where were you living before you came into the hospital? They'll probably tell you, oh, 123 Main Street. But if you had a corroborating source, they would say, oh, they used to live at 123 Main Street, but that was 20 years ago, right? They have an amnesia to the things that are more recent in their memory trace. Similarly, they may be able to pull random information that they have in their memory stores 
and they try and plug it in and they don't really see how it doesn't fit. So if you ask them, how'd you end up in the hospital? Oh, I'm sick. Well, how did you get sick? Oh, well, I, I fell, right? They may have fallen at some point 10 years ago, but they don't have any memory for their most recent injury. So they're going to take any information that's on the shelves in their storage house of their memory that might fit and try and plug it in and force it to fit into the situation. That's often what confabulation looks like. Hey, thank you so much um, for providing insight on this topic. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly before um, we go. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that on um, July 31st, we'll be having another um, lecture on the hypothalamus and pituitary gland and hormones um, provided by Dr. Nora Coltis. So I hope to see you all there and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.